Sports. Broadcasting across the nation, from the East Coast to the West. Keeping you up to date on technology, while enjoying a little whiskey on the side. With leading edge topics, along with special guests, to navigate technology in a segmented, stylized radio program. The information that will make you go, hmm. Pull up a seat, raise a glass with our hosts as we spend the next hour talking about technology for the common person. Welcome to Tech Time Radio with Nathan Mum. Welcome to Tech Time with Nathan Mum, the show that makes you go, hmm, technology news of the week. The show for the everyday person talking about technology broadcasting across the nation with insightful segments on subjects weeks ahead of the mainstream media. We welcome our radio audience of 35 million listeners to an hour of insightful technology news. Each week, our show covers the weekly top technology subjects. Without a political agenda, we verify the facts, and we do it with a sense of humor in less than 60 minutes, and of course, with a little whiskey on the side. I'm Nathan Mum. Welcome to our show today. We live stream during our show on five of the most popular platforms, including YouTube, Twitch.tv, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We encourage you to watch us live or visit us online at techtimeradio.com, or you can become a Patreon supporter. We thank those that have joined our Patreon support page. You can visit that at patreon.com forward slash techtimeradio and listen to the show with special features and minus the commercials. This helps the show uh, out, so thank you for that support. You can also tweet us during the show if you want to ask us a question live on the area. All you got to do is do hashtag Tech Time Radio on Twitter. You got to do it soon before Twitter disappears. So make sure you do that. And we'll do our best to respond to your tweet. If you enjoy the show, make sure you give us a five-star review on whatever podcast service you may use. I'm your host, a technologist with 30 years of technology expertise working for Fortune 500 companies across the country. My co-host here, Mike Roday, is an award-winning author. Originally from Arizona, Mike's a human behavior expert living in the Seattle area with a master degree in forensic psychology. Mike is here to keep me from geeking out and providing insight into human behavior and how it interacts with technology. Now, Mr. Gorday is pretty knowledgeable with technology. You're getting more and more knowledgeable. So soon you're going to just be your own little uh, host show and you'll talk about technology, eh? Mm, sure. Okay, all right. Why not? <laughs> okay, all right. Well, we're two friends from different backgrounds and we bring the best technology show possible every week. For our family, friends, and fans to enjoy. Welcome, everyone. Let's start today's show. Now on today's show. Today on Tech Time with Nathan Mum, Twitter is dying. We're going to be talking about this. Twitter is in bad are, shape Are you right sure? Now. Yeah, it's in some bad shape. Now, I hope okay. it recovers because I actually like Twitter and I find it very useful. So I hope it recovers. But we're going to be talking about some you very serious- You think it's going to go down before Facebook? Oh, man. I, I, if I, you would have asked should, me this a year ago- You should ago, start doing a pool. Oh, no. Because Facebook is already a nosedive. I don't want these two to both to go out of there. So yeah, we're going to be talking about that. And guess what? Speaking of the same guy that owns Twitter, let's say I have a Tesla app to access my car- which most Did Tesla owners do. Again? Well, what happens if I go to a vehicle and I can get in someone else's vehicle instead of mine? We're going to talk about this actually happened. That might be fun. And we have a whole story about it in our technology fail that you're going to absolutely want to uh, make sure you listen to through the show to get that. Then Amazon opens its low bandwidth sidewalk network to developers. We're going to talk about why I'm concerned about that. Yeah, we talked about that before. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that even more of what's going on now. Plus, we have a segment on VR, how it's revolutionizing therapy. You got that. And we have Phil Hennessy back on the show. He's going to be talking to us about details regarding the James Webb Space Telescope today on our second part of our mini series revolving around the details of this technical marvel. Now, uh, we're not going to do any uh, Bugs Bunny uh, jokes or anything like that. Well, sure. maybe we will. Yeah. Okay. In addition, we're talking about you. <laughs> That's right. In addition, we have our standard features, including Mike's mesmerizing moment this week in technology and a possible Nathan Nugget. I hope so. We get through enough time today. My Nugget, oh, I'm, I'm going to go on a rant. I got like four Nuggets queued up. I don't know which one to go for. Oh, okay. So. Well, we'll and find out. On the great side of things, we have our pick of the day whiskey tasting during the commercials to see if our selected whiskey... Get zero, one, or two thumbs up at the end of the show. So sit back, raise a glass, and welcome to Tech Time with Nathan Mum. Now it's time for the latest headlines in the world of technology. Here are our top technology stories of the week. Story number one, 
Amazon opens its low bandwidth, long range sidewalk network to developers. Let's highlight this with the Amazon press release video of this announcement today. Amazon Sidewalk uses a variety of wireless technologies, one of which is LoRa. LoRa is a low-power, long-range solution that allows any sidewalk device within range to maintain a network connection. Select devices serving as bridges pool together a tiny portion of internet bandwidth to create one expansive network. Why is that useful? Say you're out of town and you want to remotely turn on your outdoor lights. If your home network connection is lost, so is that communication. But with Amazon Sidewalk, your lights still receive that message using the shared Sidewalk network. Additionally, if you drop your keys on your morning run, Sidewalk can alert you of their approximate location. The possibilities are truly endless. With Amazon now opening up Sidewalk to developers, expect to see a growing number of tech aimed at making the world a safer, smarter, and more connected planet. All right. Did they just say a safer, smarter, and more connected planet? Well, that's what they said. Well, where, they got one out of three. Well, they got one out of three correct. A more connected planet. That's about it. So let's actually look at why this Amazon idea is totally concerning to me. <laughs> All right. Now we covered the initial yes. information on this on episode sixteen. Wow, that's a long time that ago. That was how long ago? Yeah, uh, September twenty ninth, two thousand and twenty. So that was back in two thousand and twenty. Oh. We covered this specifically when they made the announcement of the sidewalk. Now it's available to the developers. Now the shared internet, we have a lot of information because they've come on out to the developer stack so you can actually know what they're actually asking for. They're going to use up to 500 megabits per month of each user's internet account. So if I have a Comcast account, it's going to use 500. My next door neighbor is yes, 500, yes, up to 500. Now, 500 is essentially 10 minutes of a video stream. So that's actually a lot. If you think of that, that's a lot of bandwidth that's just kind of going out there that they're taking from the provider itself. Now, the main problem I have with this is that private internet connection among neighborhood members are a huge privacy concern. Mm -hmm. you got to tell me then that essentially someone is going to have access to my internet. So right now I spend a lot of effort and time making sure that I can connect to, and I have Amazon Alexa devices all over my house. I, I don't mind the actual technology and uh, Google Nest and Blink cameras. So we're Amazon ecosystem connected, absolutely. But nobody's coming into my network and using my bandwidth right now Uh Unless I have the option to turn on the Sidewalk app, which by default comes on. And we're going to talk about all the devices that Amazon has been essentially selling where this is automatically default to share. To, to, to share, right? Yes, to share. Now, the Amazon little ad talks about, well, this is great because if I can't get to my network at my home, I can use my neighbor's network to turn off my lights or to take care of my cameras. Well, if I can't get to my network at home, I have a problem. Someone's probably breaking into my house or there's a major issue if my next door neighbor's internet is working and my internet is not working, right? I mean, that should be a red flag to anything. So I don't know how this helps make me feel good. And essentially, let's talk about the hackers and vulnerabilities that are going to be out there. Huge. The development group is now going to understand how to develop specifically towards this network which will allow them to come on in and piggyback on my internet service provider. Comcast is right. who I use. Yeah, what's, what's, what's going to keep anybody from strolling up and parking up next to my house and using my bandwidth? It's not. And the thing about it is on the internet, essentially my IP address, your internet IP address of the modem that you get is kind of mm -hmm. like my passport and serial number. That is my identity on the web. When I, you, when every time I go and look for something on the web on Comcast, no matter what it is, even if I'm in incognito mode or any of these other modes, that doesn't do anything to stop the ISP, which is Comcast, to track everything I hit. Every time I go to a website, they have information about what I looked at, what I'm doing, what I'm clicking on, and that's their right to do because I'm paying for their service to track and make sure that my IP address doesn't do anything nefarious, anything you, that was you, out there <laughs> that would cause a problem or anything. <laughs> what was that? Are you sure this shouldn't be a Nathan Nugget moment here? No, no, no. no. So this is still our story. Sorry. So <laughs> let me just tell you to safeguard your device. Do not turn on the sidewalk. Protect your neighborhood. The problems with the Amazon sidewalk are huge. No one knows what's going on on this, and they're not giving any of the information of how they keep their three-layer security safe, which I'm sure will be breached 
one of these times sooner than later. So let me tell you, if you have an Echo device, go to the Alexa app on your phone, then go to settings. So if I got an Alexa right now, Alexa, turn off Amazon Sidewalk. You can tell it to do it that way, or you can go into the app, choose on the phone settings account, and make sure you disable Amazon Sidewalk. It's called Amazon Sidewalk. If you have a Ring device, go to the Ring app, control panel, and find the Amazon Sidewalk toggle and make sure it's disabled. This is what the device shipped with. Essentially, all items that are Ring flood cameras from 2019, Ring spotlights from 2019, Ring camera mount 2019, Echo third generation and newer, Echo Dot third generation and newer, Echo Dot for kids third generation and newer, Echo Dot with clock third generation and newer, Echo Plus all generations, Echo Show All Generations, Echo Spot, Echo Studio, Echo Input, and Echo Flex, all of them by default have Amazon Sidewalk turned on. Turn so, that off. So that that's going to happen when? That happened today. That happened today. So it happened I have this morning. my Alexa app open here. Okay, you got your Alexa app? We probably need to move on to another, okay, another why, story. Do, but... do you see the Sidewalk app there under settings? Hang on, I have to get there. All right, you get there. Well, you got you got the next story, which is about VR... Uh, revolution. Yeah, we'll, we'll do this at the break. Okay, there you go. We'll come back and tell everybody how it worked. And, all right, all right. So, one of the big questions today is what VR is doing, and I I don't like the term revolutionize, but uh, can VR help with therapy? Okay, and some of this might be a a, a boon for the for the therapy industry. Okay. So Sam Stokes, a New Zealand-based sales manager, isn't usually an anxious person. This is this is a case study. Okay. Uh, but there's one thing that, as he puts it, scares the crap out of him, and that's needles. Okay. Are, there are, a lot are of people, you scared of needles? No, I'm not. But I know a lot of people are. One of my one of my sons is scared of needles. Is he? Yep. Yeah. I. I are you scared of needles? Oh no, no. I I I watch. You watch? For yeah. When I get shots and stuff, I'm I like I'm like watching. I'm seeing them push, pushing the medicine or take it out with the yep. new suction cups. Yeah. Okay. At any rate, uh, Stokes overcame his phobia through virtual reality, a buzzy technology that industry giants like Meta and Sony believe could be the future of gaming and online socializing. With Apple expected to announce its first headset this year, in 2023, that could be a landmark moment for this technology. Now, what he was what he was doing was probably what's called exposure therapy. Okay. which uh, they put him into this virtual reality uh, situation where he's exposed to this this phobia-based, this fear. Okay. And by using the virtual reality to expose him to that, then you start building up sort of a tolerance for it. So you get used to so it. So you get used to it. Okay. And the, the, the fear subsides, right? Uh. In 2023, despite the pandemic shining a spotlight on stress, anxiety, and burnout, feels like we're still talking about VR's potential as opposed to its impact. We're still far from the world in which strapping on a VR headset to conquer your fear of crowds is as common as calling your therapist before a subway commute. It's not because of technological shortcomings. Rather, it's the high cost of the equipment that is the real problem here. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Dr. Barbara Rothbaum, Associate Vice Chair of Clinical Research at Emory University School of Medicine, uh, said that they thought they'd actually be farther along by now. Uh, she, she conducted a study published in 1995 examining how VR could be used in psychotherapy. She thought that more people would be using it for therapeutic interventions. Of course, we know that that's not the case. Treating phobia seems like a natural application for virtual reality. Boarding a virtual airplane or staring down from the top of a digital skyscraper is much more vivid than imagining in it. And again, that's where that exposure piece of the therapy comes in. That makes sense. By virtual reality isn't a magic wand for making anxiety and phobias disappear. It's merely another resource therapists can use when providing exposure therapy, which I talked about. The technique that helps people overcome fear by exposing them to in fear-inducing stimuli in a safe environment. So... Okay. Uh, that's why I, that's why I don't like the revolutionized thing. Okay, the title because it's been out because there. But, but, but people it, aren't it are, revolutionized means that it overtakes and and this is just this simply, is more of a this tool is simply set. another tool. There's more. This is another tool for therapists to eventually use, and I think that's a good thing. Okay. And that's all I'm going to say about that. In the right. words of Forrest Gump. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, that's all right. Okay, <laughs> well, let's now then move to story number three. Twitter is dying, and we have okay, an expert. Okay, yeah, let's talk about this. Uh, we have an expert from Yahoo Business, and they want to share it with everyone about this $24 billion sinkhole that Elon Musk has got himself into. Twitter is apparently worth just half of what Elon Musk paid for it, according to a leaked memo from the company. Since Musk's takeover, the company has seen ad revenue plummet and employee headcount slashed by more than half. To get to a $250 billion valuation is where he wants to get it eventually. Um, I don't know how you do that at this point. Like $20 billion is what it's worth now versus the $44 billion. So it's, a, it's well, almost he must be half. a little PO'd about that. I think so. You know what? <laughs> well, here's what's going wrong with it. Essentially, Twitter it has gotten itself in trouble for Elon Musk just kind of being the focal point of it. Uh, they also got in problems just this Monday where essentially um, we had their code base for how it works was publicly posted on GitHub, which is this developer series. So Mm -hmm. all of the secrets that you have built into how you make Twitter successful will are available for uh, other individuals. Other things that are causing Twitter to have problems is that they are essentially removing all of those official accounts if you don't decide to pay for it. So all these people have spent years. It's a big deal to be Twitter verified. You have to be a celebrity or you have to spend a lot of time developing that. As of April 1st, what a data pick for this, right? So as of April Fool's, and it's not going to be a Fool's joke. If you have a verified account and you no longer pay for it, you're going to lose that account? Yeah, it will disappear. $7.99 to keep your account per month or it goes away. Wow, that sounds a little like... uh... Strong, strong arming people, doesn't it? Yeah. So Elon Musk wants people to display a blue check mark that essentially says they're not verified, but they're paid. The simple truth is that the value of a website can go up when people are using it. And it's very tough to build that upward momentum. But to crash a website and to have people abandon a platform can happen over weeks. It's not overnight, but over weeks where people say, I'm no longer using it. I'm no longer using it. And Twitter has lost half of their registered accounts already. People have decided to close those. So any registered account, any verified account have left the platform And with this additional cost, people are going to continue to drop. And guess what? If people aren't using it to get your news, I used to love Twitter. It was information, some news facts. It would give me updates on starting lineups for basketball games. It was just like a very factual. Here's who's starting, this person, this person, this person. Here's what's going on. Here's some information. If I wanted to read a larger letter, I could click on a link that was nearly attached to the tweet that's there. If you lose your followers and the people that are posting, the platform will die. And Musk better figure it out very quickly, otherwise it will. Well, maybe he should stop tweeting random stuff and start start doing stuff that he needs to do. Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing though. Facebook's trying to do their verification too, right? Everybody's trying to get a little. Maybe this is maybe this is a good sort of social thing. We're all apocalypse. This uh, it's the social media apocalypse. We all start back over again. Yeah, we just get rid of it all and and stop doing because some of this stuff is maddening. You know what's interesting is as Twitter continues to fall, the standard text messaging of your phones have increased by over two hundred percent. How about that? So you have a technology that you could use to do that. That's what we usually use, and you can have group chats. And guess and what? Nobody's this... checking. Nobody's checking out my my tweets. Yeah, there you go. All right. Well, that ends our top technology stories of the week. Moving on to our next segment. Up next, we have Phil Hennessy back on the show for a multi-part series. This is part two about the details of the James Webb. Space Telescope. Now, it's the James Webb Space Telescope. If you just call it the James Webb Telescope, then you're not in the lingo. I I was calling it that, and Phil corrected me and said, listen, it's the Space Telescope. So I got that. I'll make sure to add the space in front of the telescope so I know exactly what I'm talking about. That's what you took away from this? Well, that's that's what I took it from. He he slapped me on Monday telling me a couple things I need to do. Yeah, that's what I did. (laughs) All right, you're listening to Tech Time. It's better than the... Marvin the Martian. There you go. (laughs) You're listening to Tech Time with Nathan Mum. We'll be back after these commercial breaks. Hey, Mike, I'm looking for some help writing our blog post for Tech Time Radio. Uh, Well, you should try Phosphor AI. It's an online service that will save you hours of work with your content creation. Simply type in your title and their AI software will get to work writing a high quality original article for you. You'll need to review the article and take 15 to 20 minutes to make necessary edits before publishing. But You'll get free articles just for signing up so you can try out the service and see how it works for you. 
How many articles do I get free? I, I already said you get three free articles. You should listen when I'm talking to you. Phosphor AI pricing is very reasonable for the quality of content that you'll get. Why waste time writing the content yourself when you get Phosphor AI to do it for you? Visit them online today at Phosphor AI. Again, that's P H O S P H O R A I dot com. Welcome back to Tech Time with Nathan Mum. Tech Time is a weekly hour technology show that talks about current technology in a simple format without having to geek out. Brought to you by myself, Nathan Mum, and Mike Roday. We just had our first whiskey tasting during the break. And let me tell you about what we're sipping on our pick of the day during the show today. We have chosen the Starward Twofold Double Grain Australian Whiskey. Yeah, now, this is good. This is you, you're liking it, no, huh? Oh, this is very good. You're like okay. All right. According to Star Wars website, Twofold was our chance to forget compromise to make a whiskey that was affordable and approachable and delicious as we wanted to. We had to tear up the rule book and be a renegade acting with. We decided to create a new process for the palate. Imagine a smooth, rich caramel dessert balanced with by tropical fruit. Do you, you taste the tropical fruit? Oh yeah, I yeah, do. It's, I do. It's got the, a very, very good fruit taste. Yeah, the finish is delicate and long. A delicious dry finish from a faded sweetness. Now this is two years aged. Now, interesting. It's a blend of two whiskey. So a hundred percent wheat whiskey is sixty percent of the blend, and a hundred percent malted barley is forty percent. So they took a full malted barley uh, whiskey and they mixed it again, forty percent to sixty percent. With the wheat whiskey to make this flavor. Okay. What do you think about that? I don't really care about that. You know, you know, you like the taste. It's <laughs> it, 80 proof. It, it, it always comes down for me. It's about the taste and the burn. Okay. Uh, 80 proof, $51 a bottle. Nice. So this is, so Nathan went a little bit out of his pocket, but normally is it's $21 whiskey. Yeah, Nathan, Nathan went up a shelf. I did. <laughs> I was like, hey. That I, wines and more. You know what? I was all, all the shelves at the bottom level were already, all the ones we've already done. So right. I said, man, I got to move up now. Yeah, all right. There you go. Well, <laughs> that was our whiskey tasting. Hopefully you listen all the way through the show and we're going to have an opportunity to give it a thumbs up, thumbs down, or sideways thumbs as, as we take care of it. We don't now, do, do sideways thumbs. What well, is, we, 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 we do. I guess we just thumbs up. Now, you have the uh, app on your uh, phone here because you have a, a Alexa device at home. Yes. And what did you find out as I was talking? I looked at it and my Amazon sidewalk was enabled. It was enabled and it you was. probably didn't even know that. It just came out today. It was defaulted last night to enabled. So everybody out there that does not know this, that's why they need to listen. And the Tech Time Radio needs to go on out and disable it. Otherwise, right now, the Internet is being shared across the network for Amazon to use for their services. So, so do you have any opinions about whether or not this will fly and that people will use this? Or well, I don't think anybody's going to know about it. I no, think that's, that, probably, I think, what, that's it's, probably what's going to happen. That's why they, they do that. Yep. They're just going to keep on keeping it out there, and then people will just have it, and they'll be like, wow, that's really cool. Now I got a little bit of extended range for my Ring devices and for my Amazon devices, and wow, look at I can be outside, and I never knew the wireless worked this far. I'm like, yeah, yeah that's because you're right. taking your neighbors. Let's All talk right. to Phil. All right. <laughs> okay. Today we welcome back Phil in our series that we've been talking about, Space. The Final Frontiers. These are the voyages of Phil Hennessy. His continuing mission to bring details on technology for our tech time listeners. You just listeners. can't help yourself, can Phil you? is a technology robotic expert and loves to break down technology for the normal person. As we start our Ask the Expert segment with Phil. Welcome to the segment we call Ask the Experts. With our tech time radio expert, Phil Hennessy. All right, Phil. Welcome back to the show. Hi, Phil. Thank you, thank you guys. How, how are you doing today? I'm doing. I'm doing great. How are you? Uh, okay, hang on, <laughs> hang on. Okay, let me tell you. You got the clicker going. The clicker. Now, I, I, I will tell you. We had a stream of people that said, "What is going on with your radio show?" There's a clicking noise in the back. So, so we talked about this off the air. You're gonna have to put the the pen down. For, all right. You gonna there. You go. Hands clear for the rest of the episode. <laughs> put so some we, whiskey in that hand. There you go. Okay. Right well, here, here we go, guys. Right here. Here we go. All right. So th- today we're gonna be doing. A cosmic time travel. I feel a little bit like Marty oh, McFly. No. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> and our Doc Brown on this subject is coming to us on 
the StreamYard stream. Phil is going to be it. there. All right. Today we're going to discuss the incredible engineering behind the James Webb Space Telescope instruments and how they see far back in time. So we're going to talk about how you can see back in time with this you know, telescope. Just by looking at a star, you're looking back in time. Okay. Well, hang okay. on. Don't be ruining it. There we go. We got what? What? what, what? Gorday. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. Sorry. I didn't, want right. to, I didn't want to mess that up for all you Marty McFly and it, it, Doc Brown fans. Okay, so let's explain a little bit about this uh, as Mike decided to destroy our secret. Uh, how, how does this process work when we actually kind of look back in time? Explain right. why well, we say that, Mike, that we're doing that. To Mike's point, exactly. When we're looking at stars, starlight, er, and and uh, out up in space, we're seeing the lights that been transmitted many, many eons ago and 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 uh you know the way these instruments that we're going to talk about for james webb have been designed we can see further back in time so hubble took us so far back and james webb's take us even further back to see uh than we could before so we're actually when we're viewing what we're viewing from james webb's uh views we can see extremely far back in time further than hubble is what we're going to be talking about today okay all right well we're excited to learn more about the JWST, that's my abbreviation for the James Webb Space Telescope. Let's start by comparing its predecessor, the Hubble Space Telescope. Can you tell us about the differences in the detection capabilities? Sure. I mean, it, with the Hubble, it was designed to more on the optical side of light, meaning it can see what we can see with our eyes, and that it can see galaxy evolution, it can see different different planets out there, exoplanets, other things like that. Whereas the web was designed more on with infrared technology to see further back. We'll talk about how that's possible. Whereas the Hubble has a 2.4 meter diameter, smaller diameter uh, mirror than the uh, though James Webb, which is six and a half meters in diameter. So the, J, the James Webb can see a hundred times fainter than what Hubble can see. 100 times. So the James Webb can see reaching back to about 180 million years after the Big Bang, okay. where the Hubble is about 400 million years after the Big Bang. And so put it in perspective, most that what they're thinking is the earliest stars formed around 100 to 180 million years after the Big Bang. So Hubble couldn't see the very earliest star formations and the big and uh, the James Webb Space Telescope will be is able to and and can do that. Okay. All right. So now the James Webb has something here as a side note that we talked about that can see through dust and gas that the Hubble could not. So it, why is that it, it really important to be able to see through the dust and gas? So it, what makes a difference in those areas since that's kind of a big selling point on their information? Sure. So basically it's with our infrared light, which is a different part of the spectrum of light. Um, it is really long wavelengths. It's the, it's the wavelength that produces heat. If you put your hand near a fire or something, you're fearing heat, right? That is the longer wavelengths. And that's what we can detect with Hubble. And with that is longer wavelengths, which I didn't know this either until the research is that the longer wavelengths, they actually are able to penetrate different space phenomena much easier so you can see the light that comes through it. So it allows these longer wavelengths to actually penetrate dust and uh, other debris that we can see um, as part of the, uh, the James Webb. Okay. So why does the James Webb detect objects that absorb infrared energy? So the whole infrared, explain why, why is that so important for infrared versus what the right. older telescope used to do? Sure. So what, what the James Webb can do for a scientist, they want to understand, say, what an exoplanet, what type of atmosphere that the planet has. Well, how do you do that? Well, we, the, we only have light to look at to be able to see. So what this is interesting is they have ways through detecting with light to understand chemical composition. So what they do is when the planet goes past the sun, uh, the, the atmosphere will absorb certain spectrum of the light. Okay. And so when you get that absorbing of that light, then they can detect what was absorbed. So it's the gaps in the spectrum, and then they can relate that to chemical uh, composition. So they can figure out what kind of gases are in the atmosphere. So does that mean like, is it easier to detect oxygen planets versus 
non-oxygen planets is that what she kind exactly. of exactly yeah, that kind of stuff exactly yes yeah. so if you want to okay so if you want exactly. to find a, a planet where you could have additional life on there kind of like vulcan oh, oh no uh, you no, know no, where no. they have another planet that is that's, allowed. that's a whole that's a whole different like, did i say that i don't think i said that did it, I dete- that? Like... it detects elements and 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 how they reflect okay all right okay all right i had to i had to do my star yeah. trek in what? there okay all right now so that's fascinating to talk about. Now, what are the instruments on this? So they, there's like four big instruments that they have uh, that we've talked about a little bit on last week's show. So explain we didn't, and we ran out of time. Tell me what these instruments are and what makes them unique versus what we've had previously for uh, like the Hubble. Sure. So say this four times fast. The near infrared camera. Near infrared camera. The near infrared spectrograph. Spectrograph. The mid infrared instrument, and the fine guidance sensor near infrared imager slitless spectrograph. Man, that's why you. That's why there technology you people come out with algorithms, right? And shorting words with those big long names. Algorithm? Are, you, are you talking about? You're or, not talking about algorithms. No, no, I'm talking about <laughs> acronyms. Oh, acronyms. Acronyms. Sorry, acronyms. And you're near. all over the board today. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. All right. Okay. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. So dive into them. Let's talk about these four. Do some spectrographs <laughs> of your head right now. <laughs> okay. All right. So basically, like um, with the infrared light, we can see the universe that's normally hidden. Like so, our stars being born, and we're going to go there, and galaxies far, far away. Right. All right. There you go. There we go. So near cam is like the telescope's super powered camera and it can take incredibly detailed pictures. It's the primary camera for the primary mirror. And it's so powerful. Put in perspective, it can see a bumblebee on the moon that small that far. It's just freaking powerful. Okay. And so the the near spec is a spectrograph. It does chemical analysis. So what is that? It's a detective. And what that can do is, again, it breaks down that light we were talking about from distant stars and galaxies into their colors, and then it can tell us what elements it's made of. So we can detect, again, atmosphere or if it's iron or other other chemicals and and uh, and uh, those types of things. Where the MIRI is the mid-infrared, so the near cam's cousin, it works in the mid-infrared range. And so that can see through the cosmic dust we were just talking about. So the longer wavelengths... It can see through that dust and it can tell us a little bit more about, again, uh, how stars and planets form. So we can see the penetration as we're having that big cloud of gas and dust, what's going on behind it, behind the scenes. And then the FGS nearest, N-I-R-I-S-S, is basically our GPS system. Okay. So how does the telescope see Orient where it is? And sometimes it has to stay on station on a galaxy or a star or a target for multiple, multiple hours or days. So it has a, usually it has a guidance system that then will target a specific target star that it knows it needs to lock onto while it's taking that picture. So basically it can go ahead and then understand where it is pointing at and then stay there for hours at a time, days at a time, staring into space. And, um, it also has another spectrograph that can do multiple multiple objects at one time, taking chemical analysis. So it can do that as well. And all these all these uh, instruments need to work again at a temperature of minus three hundred eighty seven degrees Fahrenheit. And any heat coming off the spacecraft can uh, can uh, upset the results of the telescope's instruments. So that's why everything has to be so cool and cold that we talked about last week. And they have air conditioning uh, units on there, right? To keep the stuff cool. On, on the Miri specifically, the Miri has its own cooler. Besides okay. having this crazy sun shield and staying in the shadow of the sun, like we talked about, then has this crazy sun shield, which is like equivalent to an SPF of a million or something like that. It's an awesome technological beer koozie. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly. exactly. So, th- th- so this is what gets me. This reminds me this this telescope of a little bit of an Apple product. And man, I can go off on Apple right now and on some repair stuff that I did. But the Hubble telescope... You're able to, if there was an issue with it, you were able to send somebody it up and get it repaired, right, Phil? Yes, correct. The Hubble, we talk, it, it, you can go up and repair it. Where this thing is uh, 930,000 miles uh, up in uh, the L2 orbit we talked about last, yeah. last and time. And there's nothing so you can do to fix out. it. So if it goes bad, you're kind of stuck. stuck. So you're kind of stuck going back to the manufacturer saying, hey, you better check those warranties, buddy. That's, that's right. You better make sure and it's that's, built right. Again, what I think is so amazing about this is the time it took and the money it took 
Um, I mean, they, everything had to work flawlessly. If anything didn't work, if they didn't deploy anything correctly, you might not even have an operational telescope, space wow. telescope. Wow. All right. It's well, amazing. that ends our segment here. We're going to talk next week, though, and finish up the segment. I want to find out what have we actually seen with this telescope, okay? So now we got through all the great details of it. It's got these four instruments. We can see bumblebees on the moon. What are we actually getting from having that telescope out there? Is it tracking Saturn so it can see certain stuff we're, on we're there? We're really cool things. Uh, is, this, is it yeah, tracking cool. Elon Musk's car he sent to space? Can they still see that no, with I don't it? think it cares about Elon Musk. <laughs> I don't think it does. <laughs> Not a lot of people do right now. Um, okay, so great. So we're going to have that you and have you back next week to yeah. finish that up. How's that sound, Phil? That sounds great. No, there's it's amazing what it's found so far. I'm I'm excited to come back and and talk about some of those things and, and yeah, it's and then uh I might just drop a couple hints of of what they're uh what they're already having the drawing board for replacement of the JWST. Okay, that'd be cool too. All right, mm-hmm. that sounds good. Okay. All right. Well, that ends our segment Ask the Expert with Phil. Up next, we have this week in technology, so now would be a great time to enjoy a little whiskey on the side. We'll be doing so during the break. You're listening to Tech Time Radio with Nathan Mum. See you in a few minutes. This is Mark and Greg for Copiers Northwest with a terrific offer called Printer Care Plus. It's simple. Buy HP printer cartridges from Copiers Northwest and we'll service your current printers for free. That sounds too good to be true. It's made possible due to our HP Copiers Northwest relationship. Copiers Northwest is an HP Platinum partner. One of only two in the entire Northwest. And now with Printer Care Plus, Copiers Northwest will provide free printer service as long as they purchase genuine HP cartridges from Copiers Northwest. That's right. IT departments no longer have to service printers. Or fix paper jams with Printer Care Plus. They can focus on more strategic initiatives. And let our experienced technicians keep their HP printers up and running. Sounds like a love-love relationship for IT departments. Don't get too carried away. So how do they get more details on Printer Care Plus? Call Copiers Northwest today, 206-282-1200, or visit copiersnw.com. Copiers Northwest. New ideas, new solutions. And now, let's look back at this week in technology. All right. We're going to go all the way back to March 27, 1884. 1884. That's a little bit ago. Guess what? That was the day the very first long-distance phone call happened. The first truly long-distance telephone call was made by Alexander Graham Bell to his assistant, Mr. Watson, from Boston to New York. The call lasted 90 minutes before the line failed. However, this call was done as an experiment using copper wire instead of galvanized iron. Spanning a distance of 235 miles for an experimental call, its success proved the feasibility of using copper wiring and opening it the possibilities of long-distance telephone service across the nation, which eventually spread out to the country and the world. That was This Week in Technology. If you ever wanted to watch some Tech Time history with over two years of video podcasts and blog information, you can visit techtimeradio.com to watch our older shows or join our Tech Timers Facebook group to talk with us live all the time on Facebook. We're going to take a commercial break here. When we return, we have the Mark Mumble Whiskey Review and our Technology Fail of the Week along with a Nathan Nugget planned. We'll see you after the break. Hello, my name is Arthur, and my life's work is connecting people with coffee. Story Coffee is a small batch specialty coffee company that uses technology to connect people to each product resource, which allows farmers to unlock their economic freedom. Try our medium roast founder series coffee, which is an exotic bourbon variety that is smooth, fresh, and elegant at storycoffee.com. That's S-T-O-R-I coffee.com. Today, you can get your first bag free when you subscribe at storycoffee.com with code TECHTIME. That's S-T-O-R-I coffee.com. The segment we've been waiting all week for, Mark's Whiskey Mumble. Well, it's March 28th today, and guess what today is? What is today? National Hot Tub Day. <laughs> National Hot Tub? National Hot Tub Day. The hot Tub Time Machine Day or a National Hot Tub Day? No, you you are really into the movie references I this am, week, you, I, I've been watching some movies this okay. weekend. Okay, there you go. Sorry. This is National Hot Tub Day. 
Uh, it's best day to love your hot tub with a little whiskey on the side. <laughs> <laughs> have you got? You have a hot tub. I, I have a hot tub. We actually that's we, inside. That's inside in, in a, a storage room. In a storage room. Yeah. Did you clean it up? No, no, no. no. I, I I I hate hot tubs. What happens is you get in a hot tub. It's good for like first four or five minutes, and then your body just like heats up, and you're like, I feel like I'm just cooking in there like a rotisserie chicken, and I got to get out. I only get in there for about five minutes tops. And I'm like jet out. I'm not. You're one stay of the most there. boring people at the party, aren't you? I am absolutely. Or, well, I hang out in the pool area. The pool area is where. Where 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 there more of the people hang out than the hot tub, right? Maybe. Depends. Okay, depends all right, on okay. what you're doing, especially if you're you know using it for a time machine. Okay, there you go. Tell us a little bit about this great whiskey. All right, so we're talking about Starward Two Fold Double Grain Australian Whiskey, originating from Melbourne, Australia. This two grain whiskey is aged in Australian red wine barrels. They select barrels from nearby vineyards, making bold Aussies reds like Shiraz Cabernet and Pinot Noir. These impart fruit, caramel, and spice notes to the spirit to keep as much of a fresh red wine flavor profile as possible. They source barrels from just a day's drive away. They either lightly char or quickly blast barrels with steam. Many are still wet with wine when they fill them with the whiskey, contributing to both the flavor and the hue of the whiskey. Hmm. For Mark, this is not one that he would add to his bar, especially for the price. Uh, his reasoning is that it's too young with a grain forward note, low proof and smooth, which means no character or flavor. Wow. No character or flavor, man. I, I can tell you already. I, this bottle, I'm glad I bought this cause this is going to go home and this one will disappear on my shelf after a couple weeks. I'll, yeah. I guarantee you I, that. I'm not, I, I don't, I don't doubt that one. One iota. There you go. All right. Uh, Mark, thank you for that mumble. As we move on in the show, let's get ready for our technology fail of the week, brought to you by Elite Executive Services, experts to help you out with your technology fail. We are out of time. Congratulations. You're a failure. Oh. I failed. Did I? Yes. Did I? Yes. Did I? Yes. Yes. All right, this week's technology fail comes to us from Tesla. There's nothing quite like getting into your car and feeling that something's off, only to realize. I, I did that once when I my car got broken into. I got in there, and I'm like, what's what's going on? I normally have papers well, did, over have here. You, have, you ever, have you ever gone out into a parking lot and went up to a car that looks like yours, and yep. you're, like, jiggling the handle and wonder why the stupid the, the thing car isn't went, working? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely, because I have a bunch of Ford Focuses, and uh, they all look the same, don't they? So, okay. <laughs> all right, so... Have you ever gotten into somebody else's car by mistake? Well, last week, one Tesla owner went even further when they realized a glitch that seemingly allowed them to not only enter someone else's car, but also drive it all over town. Now, the consultant, Rashi Rendev, was in a rush to pick up his white Tesla Model 3 on March 7th. He used the Tesla app to open the door, got in the car, and drove away. As he drove to pick up his children from school... He noticed an unfamiliar crack in the windshield and, of course, called his wife to see how it happened. His wife was unaware of the damage, and he couldn't find his cell phone charger either. Shortly afterward, he got a concerning text that told him he was driving the wrong car. As it turned out, the white Tesla Model 3 has been parked next to another near-identical car. Using the Tesla app, Rondev was able to unlock his own car. Instead, for the reason the app reportedly allowed him to unlock the different Tesla and drive it away. The similarities between the vehicles meant he didn't realize the mistake until he was contacted by the owner of the other vehicle. So the other owner comes on out and he gets into the other car since his well, Tesla is not we there. Don't, we don't know. No, that. no, no, we do. We do. Oh, We're going to find so, out. Yeah, so he gets in his, he gets in his next door, he gets into his buddy's car. Or not buddies because they don't know each other. The other one's already driven away. And so this guy is driving all around town and this other guy gets into his other car. All right. The owner had managed to find his phone number from a document in his car. So he had papers. So he was like yeah. me. He had yeah. papers in there and he's like, what the yeah. heck? Who is this guy? <laughs> Who is this guy? Upon parking and getting out of the vehicle, they noticed that the wheels were different from his own vehicle. And he was indeed driving someone else's car. Uh, quoted as saying, I was surprised how I was able to drive someone else's car by mistake for an hour and a half while his car... That's a little ridiculous. Uh, his car keys were still in his hand. So his car keys were in his hand, but he didn't ever use it because he uses the app to well, open yeah. the door, uh, the app to start the car, because it's a automatic... But 
start and open the car when you get don't, into don't it. Don't you have to have the keys aren't with the fob with Yes, yeah, but they're connects. close enough, right? Because he's close, close enough. enough. If you're right in there, they must have a radius that's a little larger than it should have been. So he gets on in. It sees the car in front of him as, hey, okay, this is okay to get into the thing. Uh, he was able to re-enter the vehicles. They both met up. They texted each other. They both met up, and they were both able to re-enter the vehicles after parking and driving it to the proper owners. The two men were able to laugh about the situation and notified the police to make a report on the matter uh, with no action taken by the police regarding the honest yeah, mistake. I don't, I don't know why they would have to call the police for that. but Well, I think they probably did just in case. I don't know, because Tesla is probably tracking. The Tesla app offers various functionalities to owners, including the ability to unlock and start the vehicle. It also offers features for climate control and monitoring charging progress. The app is supposed to be paired directly with only one individual vehicle, making it unclear how they were both able to drive each other's different car. Now, they both contacted Tesla regarding the matter, but did not receive any comments from Tesla, which does not maintain a public relations department. Yeah, they probably told them that no customer information was <laughs> ever leaked was out. Leaked out. <laughs> the Tesla app was allowed to unlock the wrong car. They were able to test the bug when they came on back Hours later, if you're a Tesla owner, keep your eyes peeled out in the parking lot to make sure you're getting into the right car. Or better yet, if you don't get into the right car, make sure you film it and send it to what me. I, what if I? And we'll split the, the millions a, of YouTube views that we would get. What if I get a Tesla app and just go walk around random and see if see if I can open up somebody I, I, else? I don't. I'm sure that they address I mean, it after now that, this issue. Now that Sidewalk is open, I can use somebody else's bandwidth to steal somebody else's <laughs> on their, uh, Tesla. Uh, on other. That's, that's like perfect. That's perfect. That's exactly awesome. All right, we're, we're going to head out to our last commercial break. When we return, we still have Mike's mesmerizing moment brought to you by Story Coffee and a possible Nathan Nugget. Absolutely. So sit back, raise a glass. You're listening to Tech Time Radio with Nathan Mum. How to see a man about a dog. It combines darkly comic short stories, powerful poems, and pulp fiction prose to create a heartbreaking and hilarious journey readers will not soon forget. Read How to See a Man About a Dog, Collected Writings, for free with Kindle Unlimited. Ebook available on Kindle, print copies available on Amazon the Book Depository, and more. This is Mike's Mesmerizing Moment, presented by Story Coffee. Visit storycoffee.com. All right, Mike, here's my question to you. What's your question? When did you last push the boundaries of your comfort zone and should you stay in your comfort zone, or should you continuously push to be outside your comfort zone? Oh, you, See, sound, here's a, like, you sound like you want a life coach. Well, I, I, I don't know if I want a life coach, but I, I wanted to, to bring it home here with your... Let, let's, talk, let's talk about... So, human beings are... We're wired yeah. to stay in our comfort zone. Okay. Okay? It's, it's called economy, economy of motion and energy conservation. Okay. Right, so when you look at lions on the plains, they spend a lot of time laying around, and then they go hunt, and then they eat and lie around. They so come on back. Sometimes they're in the trees. They they're in their yeah. economy. They're in their energy conservation mode. That's that's kind of what we do. We do that all the time. We find what's comfortable, and then we stay there. We don't like to move out of our comfort zone. Okay. Uh, now, in certain situations, that's okay, because. Why should I why should I want to be out of my comfort zone for certain things? Now when we talk about productivity or you know engaging our brains and learning new things, we have to come out of our comfort zone to do that. So the problem is overcoming the pain of that situation because anytime we push the boundaries we're creating pain and because we are essentially animals with higher consciousness uh, we don't like doing that. You see what I mean? So, okay. so there's this this sort of genetic imperative that we we hang out in our comfort zone. Okay, pushing through our comfort zone, or or you know, that's a buzzword in today's in today's coaching industry. You know, staying in your comfort zone. Um, so, when's the last time you pushed out? I'm always pushing somewhere. Okay, you know. Um, I think the the most recent one would be returning to dating. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. So that's pushing a comfort zone because you you get used to not doing that. Okay. Uh, I have a goal of learning the cello, so oh, I got okay. a cello. 
Okay. Now I have to find somebody to teach me how to play the cello. So that's moving out of moving moving out of my comfort zone. Cool. Oh, cool. All right. Well, that was Mike's mesmerizing moment. Let's move now into our Nathan Nugget. This is your Nugget of the Week. I feel, right. I feel like you rushed through that just so you could get to this. I do. Okay. So Netflix released 40 games last year, and they're going to release another 40 games in 2023. Did you know Netflix has video games? Yeah, I don't care. Okay. So let me just, <laughs> neither does anybody else. Yeah, the streaming that's... giant is having problems in their in-house gaming studio. That's because it's dumb. Well, so here's what you have to do. First of all, you got to have an iOS running 15 or later for iPhone or iPad. If you have an Android, you need 8 or 8. Point zero or later for your OS on there, which means you have to have a new device. Then what you have to do is you have to load the Netflix app on that mobile device. Okay, you can't load it on your television to play it on this big screen. You have to load it on this. Mo- so this is for this, mobile. This is for mobile games. Well, they say it's for all platforms, but clearly it's very difficult to have you then broadcast up to a television with lag. It then you have to go into the Netflix app and look for a subcategory called End Games. Once you find the end games for Netflix games, you then have to individually download that into your profile as a separate app. So essentially, you, it creates an icon. For it. you don't have to pay for it. But every single time you launch that app, it then relaunches it and makes you put in your password for Netflix. So instead of just like I go into the iOS phone or Google Play Store and I download an app, you know, Words with Friends or any of these type of apps that you have, I don't have to re-log in back to... Apple or relog in back to something else to play the game, which you have to do with Netflix. Yeah, you know, I can I can do the same thing with free to play games if I'm waiting for a doctor's appointment or something. I can do like so. Netflix is not going to make it if they make it this I don't difficult. Think they, I don't seem I don't see to see to think they're really all trying that hard. Okay, I don't think it's just kind of dumb. So don't. I mean, hell, yeah, I've got I've got all kinds of games at home yeah. that I can play if I want to on my big screen TV. So why would I why would I whip out my phone and, and my nice comfy it. lazy boy and be like, "Oh, Netflix, awesome. Thanks, buddy." Yeah, it's, it's especially nice. when they're going to go, "Hey, we saw you like this. Maybe you want to watch that or <laughs> see this." Or... <laughs> That's right. Okay. Now let's go away, move. Netflix. All right, let's get to our pick of the day. Okay. And now our pick of the day for our whiskey tastings. Let's see what bubbles to the top. All right, we got the Starward Twofold Double Grain Australian Whiskey, 80 proof, $51 a bottle. According to everything that I'm looking at here, this is a big win for me. I like this whiskey. I think it has a nice taste. I think it's smooth enough. I know that uh, Mr. Uh, Gregoire may not have it on his top shelf type of deal, but this is actually going to be on, on my middle to top level shelf. I'm giving this a big, big thumbs up. Yeah, I don't think we have to talk about what I already gave it. So. What, what What are you going to give, give it? it? I gave it a thumbs up already. I okay. gave it a thumbs up two commercials ago. All right, perfect. All right, that sounds good. Uh, Odie did, did not. Odie is sustaining from drinking today. So I guess we just have a two thumbs up day, which makes it okay to, to, to worry about. All right, well, we're almost out of time here. <laughs> are you sure? I think so. We got one minute left. Is that right? Okay, we want to thank our listeners. Maybe for- you should go off on something else. Uh, I, I go up on Apple support. Let me just tell you, Apple what? support is Why? the word. I, I don't have so much time to explain that. Let me just tell you that. It's you don't have enough time? or No, just, no. Okay. I need a 45-minute show just to cover that. Maybe you should check out our website, and I'm going to put up a blog where I put a camera in front of me and just go off on all you the can, time I've been spending. You can spending. tell them how awesome Netflix games no, are. Yeah, have you played right. any Netflix games? No. Why, why the heck would I load it five t- 15 different times? Uh, you should get in. out of your comfort zone. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we're about out of time. Listeners, if you want to talk back to us, go visit techtimeradio.com and click on the top right-hand corner, be a caller. And you can actually ask us a question. We'll play it on the air as our talk back as long as it's... Uh, Uh, Okay to play on the air. Yeah, get out of your comfort zone and call us. (laughs) All right. Remember, the science of tomorrow starts with the technology of today. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us on Tech Time Radio. We hope that you had a chance to have that hmm moment today in technology. The fun doesn't stop there. We recommend that you go to techtimeradio.com and join our fan list for the most important aspect of staying connected and winning some really great monthly prizes. We also have a few other ways to stay connected, including subscribing to our podcast on any podcast service from Apple to Google and everything in between. We're also on YouTube. So check us out on youtube.com slash tech time radio, all one word. 
We hope you enjoyed the show as much as we did making it for you. From all of us at Tech Time Radio, remember, mum's the word. Have a safe and fantastic week.